One of a new breed of museums gaining in popularity with people of all ages in all parts of the country is the Science and Technology Touch It Museum. While the participatory or Touch It exhibit is evident in science centers from New York to Mexico City to our own Pacific Science Center in Seattle, it is most dramatically apparent at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. The Exploratorium started operating in the fall of 1969 with only a handful of exhibits scattered through a cavernous building in the Palace of Fine Arts. In eight years, the museum has expanded to well over 400 exhibits and more than 200 paid and volunteer staff members. The Exploratorium is a fun place designed to appeal to people of all ages. The underlying theme of the Exploratorium is perception. It is a science museum based on a core of material that involves visual, auditory, and tactile perception. The exhibits provide demonstrations and explorations on optics, acoustics, motion, electricity, waves and resonance, atomic spectra, mathematics, and several other related phenomena. It is a museum about aspects of nature that are not generally available to people. The exhibits reflect insights about nature through the eyes of both scientists and artists. In addition to the exhibits on light, vision, sound, and so on, a new series of displays on animal behavior and animal senses is being established by Dr. Charlie Carlson. Wherever possible, the behavior of the animals is compared with the behavior of people. Dr. Charlie Carlson. They are animals that have, they're insects that are small, they eat plants, and they are frequently preyed upon by predators. So they have to watch they have to watch what's going on around them. And in this particular exhibit, we utilize the grasshopper's visual alarm system, as it were. And this system tells a grasshopper when it wants to be ready to jump. OK, so it's like the first cue that the grasshopper picks up. It's visual because it's something that happens at a distance. So the grasshopper is ready to be ready to jump whenever something approaches. And. Uh, if you take a look at the oscilloscope, you'll see a whole series of spikes that happen, and those are actually nerve impulses that are happening from a variety of cells in the grasshopper's brain. I can show you the grasshopper here. It's this particular, this particular animal here that we have. You can see this small wire here, which is implanted in the animal's uh, chest or thorax, and we have that wire in a very circuitous path actually running down to our oscilloscope over here. Which shows the nerve impulses. Which shows of the, the nerve impulses of the grasshopper. So now if everybody holds very still, okay. we'll see our trays go fairly flat. And there's still some movement in the periphery, but let me try moving now. As I move around, you can Well, you'll see a series of large spikes are happening. I think we're going to get some more some kids are running by here right now. Right there, as I yeah. moved. In that instant, you saw... You, you can, can also you can hear it. OK, now if I move it. Right there. OK, there was the series. So as I move around... Now, one problem that you is also associated with this is what happens if leaves and whatnot are moving around the grasshopper all the time. Well, and so if we go back and forth in a repetitive fashion, such as a blade of grass might do if it were moving near the grasshopper, it stops, okay? And if I go to a new spot, suddenly the activity is going to increase again. This is because the grasshopper is habituated to the signal. It's just like you wear your clothes and you don't know you have them on all the time. Well, your, your nervous system essentially says that's no longer interesting information, so I'm not going to pay any attention to it. It's no longer a threat. It's no longer a threat in the case of the grasshopper. And, and so this animal is continually looking for something new that's happening in the environment. This newness is, is a critical thing. We see grasshoppers as leapers. And that's not necessarily true, is it, John? Right. Grasshoppers, OK, you think about it, and you're used to running through fields and stuff and watching these grasshoppers right. take off. 
Well, that jump is actually a defensive maneuver by the animal to get away from a threat that's immediate. Which is yourself. Which is yourself. And normally, as you can see with these grasshoppers, and this particular large one down here, the animal is very content to just sit around. And in fact, they spend most of the time sitting around. It's the safest place for them to be. When they jump, they have no idea where they're going. Dr. Frank Oppenheimer, an atomic physicist, conceived and developed this Museum of Perception. He sees the Exploratorium as a place that integrates science, technology, and the arts. It's called a Museum of Science, Technology, and Human Perception, but it's really a learning resource, a learning center, and a resource that people can use in any way they want to, uh, which has real experiences, real props, things which show aspects of nature that people aren't familiar with, which they can build up some intuition about and gain some understanding, and uh, uh, use in a great variety of different ways, whether it's through schools, through individual wandering through, at the sightseeing level, at the real studying level, coming back over and over again. I notice there are no, no, no real guides nor uh, exhibits behind closed doors or it's it's all very out in the open what it, it, there must be some kind of a theory behind your the way you've set the exploratorium up well part of it was dictated by the space and moving into it but it turned out to be just the right kind of thing because all, nature really is all multiply connected and by dividing it up into walls or chapters of a book you lose that sense that one thing leads to another and is part of another. So this wide open space with uh, divided into some sort of sections and some organization, um, I think is the really best way to do it. This idea of the interconnections between all things in nature finds perfect expression in this glass tube. Bill Parker, one of the many artists in residence at the Exploratorium who designed and built this exhibit, likens it to a trapped lightning bolt. Well, it's, it's not really a machine. I would call it an art piece. But it's a device that shows uh, electric electricity flowing through a gas. It's very similar to a trapped lightning bolt. Um, a trapped lightning bolt? Right. Can you explain that? Um, well, lightning goes from the clouds to the ground through the atmosphere, and when it does, it makes it, the, the air glow, and that's the flash, and it's very quick normally in nature. Um, this is sort of a continuous, low-power lightning bolt. How does the blue light go tiptoe along the top like that? Well, it's, it's tiptoeing in little beads um, because the, the lightning bolt is being turned on and off very quickly and the electricity breaks up into droplets that to us look like little blue beads. Where is it going from and what is it going well, to? Well, there's, there's two ends to every circuit. Um, or every time you move electricity, it has to go from one spot to another. In this case, there's one end of the tube generating a, a push on the electricity, and the other end of the tube is pulling on that electricity. And, that's and so there's a flow, there's a problem. current, yeah. okay. that much is like a in current. a stream that we're seeing. Exactly. Now, if I put my hand somewhere in the middle, let's say, some of that electricity that is being pulled from the, from the source of the tube, source end of the tube, to the receiving end of the tube, is then attracted to my hand. Why? Well, I'm acting as much as a pull as the other end of the tube is. Are you, do you Our have electricity have, in your body? Have what, would, what you call a capacitance for electricity. It's like when you rub your feet on, a, on a, a carpet, your body gets charged up to a certain field or a certain electricity level. And when you touch a doorknob, you get a little spark. Yeah. A bigger person would get a bigger spark. Really? Because, because his body because is larger and he... absorb more field. Okay. Exactly. But you don't feel any shock when you touch this? No, this is um, uh, much less voltage, fewer electrons pushing as hard. What's inside the tube? Well, inside the tube is very little, actually. It's almost uh, a vacuum, as you'd find in outer space. But what is there is a gas called xenon, which is Greek for the stranger. The stranger. It's a very rare gas found in the atmosphere that ionizes or loses 
its electrons very easily, and that's why it, it can glow um, with very little electricity really being there. Is that similar to fluorescent tubing light? Very similar. Uh, fluorescent tubes, sometimes when they're, when they're going out, you see little bands of light, much like the beads in here. Um, it flickers. It flickers, yeah. Or a neon tube and a neon sign, very same, very much the same. The exhibits are not designed to gently lead the visitor from the simple to the complex. Connections must be made in the mind of the individual. Several exhibits demonstrate the different characteristics of sound, and most of them require some playful manipulation. Sally Dunsing, Exploratorium Teacher. Is take this violin bow, and on the edge of the plate, I'll bow down, and what's I, what I'm going to do is send pulses or waves through the metal and you'll, you'll hear it, a sound. When it hits an edge, it'll reflect off, and it'll hit all these different edges. And as it reflects off, it's gonna start bumping into each other, and I'll keep bowing, so there'll be sound waves coming off and then bouncing off, and there's all kinds of activity going on. Well, certain places, when the sound waves collide, they're actually gonna cancel each other out. So you'll get spots where there's hardly any vibration or very little vibration mm -hmm. going on. And so all the sand's going to get shoved to those particular places. Where the vibrations have stopped. Right. Yeah. I'll show you what happens. Okay. It makes a symmetrical pattern. Right. And if we had an irregular shape, I don't think the pattern would be so symmetrical. But since this is symmetrical sides, they're bouncing off symmetrically and all these different patterns form. Now I'll try another note and we can okay. get a different pattern. You really can get a variety of different patterns. Some days I'm really good at it and some days I can't. <laughs> Give it another try. <laughs> okay, I'll try one more. Okay, that's the same note. Yeah. And you can start seeing that it's about the same kind of pattern. I'll try one more on the corner. I don't know what's going to happen. As the plate rings, the sand on top dances into a symmetric pattern that shows the shape of the vibration producing the sound. 